Good evening. I'm Kate Viens, Director of Education here at the Charles River Museum of Industry, Industry and Innovation in Waltham. It's my pleasure this evening to welcome Scott Kirsner to present his Mill Talk, a photographic tour of Boston's most innovative places. Scott is the author of Innovation Economy, True Stories of Startups, Flameouts, and Inventing the Future in New England, which is available on Amazon. He has spent more than two decades as a business journalist and contributing editor at the Boston Globe, Wired Magazine, the New York Times, Business Week, and other publications. His focus on how innovations that matter get introduced to the world has taken him to the White House, the Sundance Film Festival, and the innovation labs of Google, Disney, General Motors, and many other companies. Scott is the author of other books on innovation and technology, including Inventing the Movies, which explores the challenge of bringing new ideas to Hollywood at the center of a century-old change-resistant industry. He writes a weekly column for the Boston Globe and is the CEO of Innovation Leader, a publishing company focused on innovative, effective innovation, new ventures, and R&D inside global 1,000 scale organizations. He has presented leadership strategies to corporate executives, technologists, and entrepreneurs at Harvard Business School, the MIT R&D Conference, and many other organizations. He also has appeared on NBC's Today Show, NPR's Science Friday, the Discovery Channel, and WBUR's Radio Boston. It's our pleasure to welcome Scott to the Charles River Museum. Scott? Oh my gosh, Kate, thank <laughs> you for that intro. You know, nowadays uh, you don't leave your house that much, but I'm excited to have like a night at the museum here in Waltham. Um, this museum is amazing. Uh, and Kate met mentioned to me that it's reopening to the public on April 1st, so mark your calendar. Um, because it's an incredible place. And it's, it's, so it's worth leaving the house for Night at the Museum and Kate's intro. And so I, I feel like my night here is, is pretty much done. Um, but I did prepare some slides and I prepared a little bit of a talk. Um, and my goal with this talk is you, whether you live in Boston or you live somewhere else in the world and, and maybe you plan to visit Boston uh, in the next year or two, I want to kind of walk you around some of the places that I think even a lot of longtime Bostonians and Canterbridgeans uh, and Walthamites, is that the right term for people who live in Waltham, maybe? Uh, that, that these are places that even the locals don't know the stories behind. And so um, if you're walking around Boston on your next trip, uh, if you get to downtown uh, and you maybe live out here in the suburbs of Waltham, Lexington, Weston, Wayland, um, these are some places, I just want to give you enough information about each of these places uh, to be a good tour guide. We're not going to go deep on the scholarship and dates and history and patents behind each of these places, uh, but I just want to share some of the stories that I've learned about these places so that, so that maybe you can relay them uh, to, your, to your guests and visitors. And at the very end, just to tease the end of the talk first, I want to talk about this project that Kate is involved with and uh, many other people, Museum of Science, uh, the Broad Institute, the MIT Museum, uh, Mass Historical Society. We've gotten a group of people together um, around the idea of maybe creating a trail related to innovation here in Boston, Cambridge. So that's a teaser for the end. Um, I will start off, you know, each of, these, uh, each of these places has a little Google map with it. Um, and the first place, if, if you, uh, want to situate yourself where we're starting this tour, uh, we're starting really not far from Government Center and uh, Boston City Hall at an address that unfortunately uh, was knocked down, I think, with the demolition of the West End neighborhood to create Government Center. Uh, and it was a building at 109 Court Street. And I'm not sure if you can recognize uh, the handsome fellow on the right side of the slide here. Um, we tend to see pictures of him when he's a little bit older and he has gray hair. Uh, but we're looking at Thomas Edison, who people forget that Edison started his career working in this building, uh, the Charles Williams Jr. Telegraph Instruments Supply Company. 
Um, and, and this, I like to think of it as, if you remember Radio Shack, uh, as I do, I kind of grew up hanging out in Radio Shack. This was the Radio Shack of the 1870s uh, in Boston. And you could buy your telegraph equipment in the first floor, but in the upper floors, Charles Williams rented space to people like Thomas Edison, who was thinking about ways to improve uh, the bandwidth and improve the utility of the telegraph as a communication medium. Uh, another person who worked in this building uh, was Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone uh, in one of these upstairs incubator floors at 109 Court Street. So most people, I think, would be pretty surprised if you said, uh, did you know that Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell once worked in the same incubator uh, in downtown Boston? But it's true. Um, the other fun fact about 109 Court Street is that the very first uh, telephone lines ran from Charles Williams' business uh, here in downtown Boston to his house in Somerville. Uh, his telephone number, you didn't need a long telephone number at the time, so his telephone numbers were number one and number two. <laughs> you know, that was the entire telephone directory at one point. And while you can't go in and see this building, if you're near the JFK Federal Building in downtown Boston, you can see a little podium uh, that commemorates the invention of the telephone here. We're gonna walk down Cambridge Street just a little bit towards the Charles River and stop at Mass General Hospital uh, at 55 Fruit Street and go into the oldest building, the Bullfinch Building at Mass General Hospital. Um, and this is a space that uh, you can still access, I think, in normal times. You can go up to the top and visit this space called the Ether Dome. Uh, they use it for medical lectures, but if there's not a lecture happening there, you can just walk in, as, as my friend Bob Krim and I did the day that I took uh, this photograph on the right. And the, the, the dome was built to be a, a surgical operating theater, and you could have medical students and other surgeons watching from these rows of seats uh, the surgery that was happening in the center of the room. Uh, you can kind of see the sunlight beaming into the room in this picture. Um, you know, this is, we're talking about uh, the 1860s, and so there is no uh, Edison incandescent light bulb yet. You're relying on, you know, you're having daytime surgery, not nighttime surgery, uh, and you're relying on the sun to help the surgeons see what they're doing. 1864, we're going back in time a little bit, was the year that John Collins Warren performed the first surgery where the patient was successfully anesthetized before he was cut open. So I always, uh, I always thank my lucky stars <laughs> that, uh, that we invented surgical anesthesia whenever I have to have a procedure done. But uh, the interesting connection here uh, between John Collins Warren and Thomas uh, Morton, who was a dentist who actually um, applied the anesthesia in this operation, was that John Collins Warren's dad was a surgeon who treated wounded during the Revolutionary War at the Battle of, Bunk Battle of Bunker Hill and Breeds Hill. So I love that there's this connection. You know, we always think about Boston as being the hub of revolutionary history. I love that there's this familial tie between John Warren, the dad, who was a participant in the Revolutionary War, and, and his brother was actually a combatant uh, in the Revolutionary War, and the son, John Collins Warren, uh, the surgeon at Mass General Hospital who was involved in the uh, first successful demonstration of surgical anesthesia. And the line that, uh, that people remember from that was uh, Warren said, gentlemen, this is no humbug. Uh, because there was a lot of skepticism about would ether uh, successfully knock someone out. This is a painting commemorating uh, the removal of this uh, tumor uh, from the patient's neck. And when they asked the patient afterwards, like, how was that? How did that go for you? He said, it felt like there was a little bit of scratching on my neck, but, but nothing painful. So really an amazing uh, place that still exists, you know, uh, a space from the 1860s that they're still using at Mass General Hospital uh, today. On Beacon Hill, if you walk into what they call the flat of the hill, there's an address 12 Lime Street, um, which is, uh, as far as I know today, still owned by the CEO of Plymouth Rock Assurance Company. Um, but before that person moved in, uh, it was home to uh, Georges Dorio, uh, 
who was a professor at Harvard Business School. Um, he was uh, a colonel, I think, in the army uh, during World War II. They called him General George Dorio, but uh, I, I don't believe he was actually a general. But in 1946, not long after the war, Boston was thinking about how do we rebuild uh, the economy? How do we reboot the industrial base of New England? And George Dorio was part of those discussions. And so what he wound up doing was starting what is now considered to be the first venture capital firm. It was called American Research and Development, or ARD. And uh, the person at the top is, is General Dorio. And at the bottom, you see him with Ken Olson, the founder of Digital Equipment Corporation. And Dorio's investment in digital equipment was considered the first home run ever in the venture capital um, industry. You know, hundreds and hundreds of percent of, of times the return of the original investment. Uh, digital grew to be the second biggest technology company in the world at one point after IBM. And so this is a, a, a site on our tour that is not open to the public, but uh, is still a really beautiful residence uh, on Beacon Hill. No plaques, no signage, uh, letting you know that the uh, forefather of venture capital uh, once lived here. So if we cross the river, we can go to uh, 55 Broadway uh, in Cambridge, and there's a building uh, that I believe is slated to be knocked down called the Volpe Transportation Center. Uh, MIT is in the process of redeveloping uh, this whole area, but the history here and the reason this building was originally built is that in the 60s, uh, Cambridge was home to Draper Labs, which is an MIT-affiliated research group that created most of the guidance computers and guidance software that uh, help the Apollo spacecraft find the moon and successfully land on the moon. One of the key players in that effort was Margaret Hamilton, who was, uh, was one of the software developers uh, at Draper Labs. And there are some great pictures of her with printouts that are about this high of the software code that was written to help the Apollo spacecraft get to the moon. Uh, I love the fact Margaret Hamilton is still alive and still lives in Cambridge. Uh, and it's on my bucket list to interview her at some point. She is very elusive, and uh, it almost happened for me uh, two or three years ago at the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, but I'm hanging in there. So the plan was, since MIT and Draper Labs had already been such key contributors to the Apollo space uh, effort, NASA decided that it would set up what they called the Electronics Research Center, or ERC, in Kendall Square. And so this tall building that you see in the photos was, um, was the first building built for the ERC. But they knocked down uh, huge swaths of Kendall Square. And you can see what used to be there in this picture, a lot of low-lying industrial buildings, many of them very similar to the one we're in today, three, four-story brick, uh, brick buildings that made uh, hoses and bicycle tires and all kinds of, um, you know, early 19th century or not early 1900s products. So NASA knocks down this entire neighborhood uh, thinking we're going to build a vast NASA campus to develop electronics for the, uh, for the space program. This is the only NASA facility ever that has been closed. In the whole history of NASA, only one facility has been closed. The ERC only lasted about six years from 1964 to 1970. Uh, Nixon was president uh, in 1970. There were cutbacks at NASA. Um, the story goes that Nixon was not really a fan of Massachusetts and was not a fan of the Kennedys, who had really laid the groundwork for this ERC site to be in Massachusetts. And he said, well, if we have to pick one NASA facility to close, this is going to be the one that goes. And so there's no more NASA in Kendall Square. Um, but what you did have after they raised the entire neighborhood is you had the construction um, of a whole lot of office buildings that today house Google and Microsoft and Cambridge Innovation Center um, and you know dozens of biotech companies. So it's interesting to think about the alternate history where you would have a major NASA campus in Kendall Square. Would we rather have that and kind of have Cambridge be a government town or would we rather have 
a hundred or so biotech, pharma, and, and tech companies. Uh, it's an interesting debate to have. So moving along in Cambridge, um, this is just one of my favorite buildings and I encourage you if you're walking around, biking around, driving around the neighborhood to stop and check it out. It's at 700 Main Street and um, it's a building that um, both ties to Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Watson, but even before that, uh, this, this building was originally built um, for a manufacturer of passenger railroad cars. So it was kind of an important company when railroads were the key mode of transportation in the United States. Um, it was also uh, a site of the Walworth Manufacturing Company, which made the Stilson wrench and other tools. And I think while it was uh, a tool company, uh, the, the owner or the foreman of that tool company said to Alexander Graham Bell, yes, you can use my building for your first demonstration of a long distance telephone call. And at the time, long distance meant from 109 Court Street in Boston over the Longfellow Bridge to Cambridge. So proving that you could call uh, Cambridge from Boston was the demonstration at this building. There is a plaque outside that commemorates uh, that first demonstration. Uh, I think Thomas Watson was sent over here to Cambridge. Alexander Graham Bell was in Boston. Um, so you can look for the plaque. The other thing that I love about the building, tying back to its railroad heritage, is if you look carefully at the windows, they actually have steel rails uh, embedded at the top of the windows, which is a really nice decorative touch. And if railroads and wrenches and telephones were not enough for you, this building was also the private R&D lab of Edwin Land when he was running Polaroid. Um, Polaroid, people forget, was one of really the huge drivers of the consumerization of new technologies. Uh, Steve Jobs, in the early days of Apple, used Polaroid as the reference of, this is the kind of company I want to build. You know, I want to put technology into the hands of the average person, not wealthy people, not only business people. Um, you know, I want to get Apple's products into as many people's hands as, as Edwin Land did. Um, so I'm, I'm sharing a few great, uh, both pictures of Polaroid cameras and uh, also some of the output of uh, Polaroids taken by uh, Andy Warhol and, uh, and Dorothea Lange. If you go into the building today, it's a startup hub for biotech companies uh, called Lab Central. And I love the fact they have this Warhol-esque picture of telephones hanging over a couch. And they also now have a little display uh, related to Polaroid in the entryway. Our next stop, I, I think, is a company that everybody knows the name of, uh, uh, no thanks to uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but it's an example of the type of company that is popping up today in Kendall Square, and that is uh, Moderna Therapeutics. Um, this is your classic group of scientists saying, we've discovered this messenger, this thing called messenger RNA, what can we use it for? Uh, can we use it to treat cancer? Can we use it to treat uh, rare viruses? Um, they had raised a lot of money, they had gone public, they had no products in the market. Uh, COVID comes along and it turns out the MRA, mRNA technology was the perfect tool uh, to use to address uh, the COVID virus. And uh, I'm not sure what Moderna's market cap is, but it's, it's uh, quite a valuable company. It has turned uh, at least two of its scientific founders who are professors uh, at MIT and at Harvard into billionaires. Uh, it has turned one of its venture capitalist founders into billionaires and into a billionaire and created uh, a lot of 21st century wealth in Cambridge. This is just a fun one uh, because I think if you walk by 810 Main Street on your way from Kendall Square into Central Square, uh, you probably have seen this building. Maybe you have smelled this building um, and it's not well known what goes on inside this building. There's a sign you can see at the left that looks like Tootsie Roll, a Tootsie Roll wrapper, and it says Cambridge Brands Inc. It basically is a sign that says, don't drive into our parking lot. And that is just all you see when you walk by this building. I had always been curious um, to understand more about it. And there are just, you know, uh, 
like a, like a Tootsie Pop, there's layer upon layer of uh, story to discover here. Um, first of all, Central Square used to be, um, you know, uh, a, a dense neighborhood for candy companies. The building that we're looking at on the left was built in 1927 by a candy company that nobody remembers called James O. Welch Company. Uh, but they invented sugar babies, sugar daddies, sugar mamas, and a whole bunch of other caramel uh, intensive candies, um, some of which are still on the market. But today it is owned by Tootsie Roll Industries. Uh, and so it doesn't say, I think it may be the sign in small type says a division of Tootsie Roll Industries. They don't actually make Tootsie Rolls in this factory. They make the entire world supply of junior mints, 14 million junior mints a day. Um, I loved finding that out because junior mints are my favorite candy. Um, the other thing that I loved finding out is that the CEO of Tootsie Roll Industries, Ellen Gordon, who's shown at the center of this picture, lives in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Uh, Tootsie Roll is based in Chicago. Nobody knows that the CEO of Tootsie Roll spends most of her time in Wellesley, Massachusetts. If you talk to people who are Wellesley old timers, they will tell you, oh yeah, we used to trick or treat at the Tootsie Roll family house. And they would of course give out Tootsie Rolls on Halloween. Uh, but Ellen Gordon uh, is in her 80s. I don't remember her specific age, but she is the oldest CEO of a publicly traded uh, company. And despite my having tried many, many times to get into the Cambridge Brands Junior Mints factory, I have not been uh, successful at that yet. But this is one of the most popular um, shared Boston Globe columns I've ever written uh, about the Cambridge Brands factory in Central Square. We're going to do 11 places. So um, we're going to have time for questions from you and maybe questions from, from Kate. 18 Brattle Street is a place that is in transition right now. It is a former newsstand called Out of Town News. Um, which used to be a fantastic place to buy newspapers and magazines around the world. Uh, the city of Cambridge is redeveloping it. The newsstand um, kind of combination of going out of business, losing their lease. I forget the specifics of why there is no newsstand uh, in out of town news anymore, but it's, it's kind of sad uh, because this is the place in 1975 that Paul Allen, uh, the late Paul Allen, who's on the left in the black and white photo uh, that you see on the screen, bought this issue of Popular Electronics Magazine for 75 cents, and he said, this Altair 8800 looks like a really cool computer. Uh, Paul Allen was working as a programmer at the time for Honeywell here in the Boston area, and he was so excited about this magazine that he told his friend Bill Gates, who was a student at Harvard, you know, I think there's going to be an opportunity to create software for the Altair 8800. And that was basically the moment that led to the creation of Microsoft. I did check this number today. Microsoft is now almost a $2.3 trillion market cap company. And I think it might not exist if it were not, if uh, it were not for out of town news right by the Harvard Square tea station. This is another thing that it amazes me there is no plaque that, you know, this is the spot that uh, Paul Allen decided I should, I should start a company. We're going to go just a few blocks away and if you walk to the Harvard campus uh, you can look for 16 Divinity Avenue in Cambridge. Uh, the buildings have giant rhinoceri outside, uh, rhinoceroses, rhinoceri. Um, and they're biological research labs. The quick and kind of crazy story about Cambridge in this era, the same era of Microsoft, 1975 is, is the creation of Microsoft, 1976 is the year we're talking about now. And um, there were people like Wally Gilbert, who was a professor at Harvard at the time, who were very interested in um, basically hacking DNA, using recombinant DNA technology um, to attack diseases in new ways. And this is basically the, the genesis of the biotechnology industry. And when you started explaining the way that you would splice DNA together and put it into cells, 
uh, people like the guy at the lower left corner of the slide started getting a little worried and thinking, are you going to create um, you know, uh, rats with viruses unknown to man that are gonna escape from your lab? Are you going to create Frankenstein monsters? There was a lot of fear mongering around what recombinant DNA technology uh, might do. Maybe you would create giant uh, bronze rhinoceroses that would <laughs> rampage through Cambridge uh, and cause destruction. But the guy at the bottom left was the mayor of Cambridge at the time. And so you had this really interesting moment in Cambridge where uh, Mayor Al Vellucci was kind of a frequent foe of Harvard and MIT. He was more of a working class guy. He didn't really like the uh, the professors and the suits and the smarty pants at those campuses. And so there were hearings held at Cambridge City Hall of should we allow Harvard and MIT to do research with recombinant DNA technology in these new labs that they're planning to build. And it led to a really interesting debate in 1976. You actually had um, weekends where you would go into Kendall Square and there would be tables, there would be pro and con tables set up should we allow this kind of research in Cambridge? Yes, no, we shouldn't allow this kind of research. You know, the con table. And the result of this debate was that Cambridge was the first city in the United States, maybe in the world, to create a set of guidelines about what would make this research safe and acceptable for the city of Cambridge. They created a citizens advisory committee and it had you know, a doctor, a nurse, a nun, um, I'm not sure why the nun was, uh, was necessary, but she was there. Um, and they created these guidelines which allowed biotech companies to set up shop in Cambridge. Um, it made Cambridge, you know, it really laid the groundwork for Cambridge to be the world center of biotech. Wally Gilbert actually had to leave Harvard um, to go uh, spend more time, or he decided to leave his professorship at Harvard to spend more time on a company called Biogen. Uh, which was founded in 1978. The funny thing that Dr. Gilbert told me, he also was a Nobel laureate, and uh, this picture was from a breakfast that we had at Henrietta's table uh, in Harvard Square. And he told me in the 70s, the belief was Genentech was one of the early biotech companies that had started out in the San Francisco area. And so the venture capitalists at the time said, we think there's room for about one biotech company in the United States, and we already have Genentech, and there's gonna be room for one biotech company in Europe, and that's gonna be Biogen, uh, which had a bunch of, uh, its original headquarters was in Switzerland, and they had a bunch of Swiss scientists involved. So I love the idea that maybe the world is only gonna have two biotech companies. One will be in the US, one will be in Europe. Um, Dr. Gilbert, for a while, served as the CEO of Biogen, and he really helped set up their, their US operations in Cambridge. So stop number 10 here, we're going, we're still in Harvard Square, we're going across the Charles River to the campus of Harvard Business School. Um, and we're all in the same time period, 1978, when a Harvard Business School student uh, named Dan Bricklin, who is on the right, is working in his class with paper spreadsheets. Um, and doing the calculations, you know, every time you have to change a cell on the paper spreadsheet, you have to recalculate everything, um, you know, likely with a pocket calculator at the time. And Dan was interested in some of the early personal computers that were just then uh, coming onto the market. And he said, I bet we could digitize this process. I think we should have spreadsheets on our computers. And uh, Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston um, created the first spreadsheet, which was called VisiCalc. Um, they created it for the Apple II computer. Um, and Steve Jobs has said that if it wasn't for VisiCalc running on the Apple II, he's not sure that Apple would have been a successful company. That's how key it was that spreadsheet software was written for Apple and not IBM, not Altair, not Osborne, not any of the other computers that may have been floating around at the time. This is called, VisiCalc is really called the original killer app of the personal computing era because it gave lots of independent sole proprietor business people, lots of small businesses, lots of medium sized businesses, um, a reason to, to purchase an Apple computer. Uh, this is actually a picture of the classroom where Dan Bricklin had the idea to create VisiCalc. And there is here a plaque on the left side of the classroom 
um, commemorating this is the place where uh, the electronic spreadsheet was invented. There, many people remember Lotus 123, which was a company that came in to compete uh, with VisiCalc. Uh, and most people today say, oh, wasn't Excel the first spreadsheet? No, Excel was not the first spreadsheet, uh, but there were lots of fast followers. Um, to the idea that we should be able to use our computers uh, to do all of these calculations. I wanted to pick a stop that is a little bit bizarre and unexpected and also more current as our last stop, and it's 22 McGrath Highway in Somerville. It's called the Twin City Plaza, and it's basically a strip mall. Um, it has a Dollar Tree store in it. Uh, it has a grocery store. Uh, it used to have a guitar center. It is a, it's been upgraded recently, but it used to be a pretty low rent uh, strip mall. And I wanna go ahead one slide to talk about this company um, called iRobot, uh, which was uh, not founded in this strip mall, but their first real office was in this strip mall. Um, it's close enough to MIT that you can walk back and forth or bike back and forth from the MIT campus to this little strip mall in Somerville. Um, and the very first time, uh, you know, iRobot originally was working for uh, the Department of Defense to create these bomb disposal robots. They had a failed project with Hasbro to create a realistic baby, which everybody felt was way too creepy to be a successful uh, toy. And I remember going to this strip mall, iRobot was in the second floor above all of the shops, and they had just developed the Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner. Uh, Colin Angle, who was, this, was and is the CEO of the company, he's on the left in the picture there with Helen Grainer and Rod Brooks, his co-founders. Um, Colin at the time still thought they should call it the Cyber Suck. That was the initial uh, name for the Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner, but luckily, um, they had second thoughts about launching a product called the CyberSuck uh, and renamed it the Roomba. A lot of the early marketing for the Roomba was done on infomercials because they felt like that would be a, an inexpensive and efficient way to reach people who um, maybe didn't want to vacuum anymore. I love the fact, actually, there are va antique vacuum cleaners here at the Charles Ruhr Museum of Industry and Innovation, and we need to get a, some early iRobot Roomba prototypes. Uh, on display. I think that would be a lot of fun. I, for whatever reason, after iRobot grew up, they became a public company, they moved out to the suburbs. Um, their revenues are really driven by the sale of Roomba robotic vacuum cleaners now. Um, the space sat empty for a long time, but then I, I ran into this guy, Max Lebovsky, who, just like the founders of iRobot, was a graduate of MIT. Um, he and some friends started a 3D printing company, a, a company to make 3D printers called Form Labs. Um, and he has moved into the old iRobot space in the Twin City Mall. And um, to tie this a little bit into COVID, one of the things they were using their 3D printers for was, uh, if you remember in, in the spring of 2020 and into the summer of 2020, there was a real shortage of swabs for um, swabbing your nose to get, a, to get a sample for a COVID test. And they realized they could 3D print a plastic um, swab. And so uh, they both did some printing here above the mall, but they also created models of this swab that hospitals around the world and healthcare systems around the world who owned these Form Labs 3D printers could print out their own swabs and deal with the shortage that way. So I have a little bit extra time. I actually want to maybe touch on a bonus story, but I also want to talk about uh, this idea of creating an innovation trail of Boston and Cambridge so that, um, you know, these stories don't exist just in a YouTube stream, uh, just in uh, the book that is up on the screen, uh, just in a few plaques here or there, but really trying to knit some of these spaces together, some of these places together, so that you can have something that feels like the Freedom Trail that you could experience over the course of an hour or two or a day, um, and really tell these stories and showcase Boston as a hotbed of innovation over centuries and centuries. Uh, in a way that's coherent and has kind of a unified, uh, a unified narrative. 
I think I wasn't sure how long uh, this talk was going to run, so I'd love to maybe bring Kate up and see if she has some questions, and then maybe the very last story, if we have time for it, is a, is a fun one related to the movie industry. Kate? Terrific. Thank you very much, Scott. That was fascinating. What I love about the presentation that you made and, and, uh, and the idea of the innovation trail, which we'll talk about a little bit more, is the way that uh, it expands our idea of innovation. We think of innovation as being an activity that is solidly in the 21st century, uh, often related to, uh, to uh, high tech as defined by the computer industry uh, and related industries, uh, gaming. And, and, and this is a, a, a project that um, shows the long history of American innovation and really, as I say, expands that definition to include medicine, commerce, finance. Um, yeah, I totally agree. And that's the motivation behind it. I think there are um, some cool, some even lesser known stories about the patent draftsman, Louis Latimer, mm -hmm. who helped Bell draw the patent drawings that he needed to submit uh, to get a patent on the telephone. Uh, Louis Latimer was the son of a runaway uh, enslaved person who wound up in Boston. Uh, Latimer was pretty much uh, was pretty much a self-taught draftsman. Uh, there was an incredible race where Bell and Elisha Gray, another inventor, were literally submitting within hours of each other. And mm -hmm. Louis Latimer is this character who, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think of it. He wasn't an inventor, mm -hmm. right? He was mm -hmm. a draftsman. He later went on to work for Thomas Edison and was kind of a key player down in Menlo Park. Um, but those are the kind of stories that I love because, like you say, they broaden our idea of who is an innovator, who is a change maker in society, and, and who makes a difference as we, you know, as we try to drive progress forward across all these different domains. Mm -hmm. And to find so much of that present in the Boston area is just extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I think the Boston area is so driven by discovery. I spent a few years living out in San Francisco and doing a lot of visits to the Googleplex in, uh, you know, in Mountain View, California, and driving up and down the 101. And, you know, there is a love in Boston of kind of the initial breakthrough, the eureka moment, um, being on the cutting edge of something. Silicon Valley is so much about how do we take this two-person company and make it a 50,000-person company? And how do we get wealthy on this idea and really scale it, as they say. Boston, I think, just loves the moment of discovery. Well, Boston has a tremendous historical appreciation as well. So, I, I think so that's probably true. immediately is able to put those, or in short order, is able to put those achievements into a historical perspective. I think that's true. We do love history here yeah. in Boston. But part of, the, part of what's motivating this group that has organized around the, the innovation trail um, is that when you say history in Boston, you think revolution, because mm -hmm. that's what the Freedom Trail has been so successful that mm -hmm. you know, the reason people walk it is to teach their kids about the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. I think maybe in a stretch, people wind up at the Lowell Mills and they learn about the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, but that still leaves out you know, huge pieces of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Before we talk a little bit more about the Innovation Trail, um, uh, a couple of other questions. You offered intriguing stories of both government-sponsored research and then these serendipitous moments of Paul Allen in front of out-of-town news or, uh, um, or the public becoming involved in the question of whether Cambridge would become a biotech center. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you, can you reflect just briefly on the, on the the distinctions between government-sponsored research and that that comes from individual uh, connections. Yeah, I think, I think the thing that is so unique about Boston is it has never been a company town in any sense of the word. And I, I do believe that, you know, if this NASA campus had taken over Cambridge, mm -hmm. you know, we would not be as, as, you know, you wouldn't see the richness and diversity of innovation that you see now in Kendall Square. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, that mix of, hey, there's government funded research happening at the universities, there's Pentagon funded research happening at places like 
Boston Dynamics not far from here where they develop the humanoid robots and the robotic walking dogs. You have innovation that's driven by individual angel investors, they call them. Um, you know, there's an angel investor that I've written about who is still the first person that people call when they have an idea and want to, and, and you know, it's not clear whether you could get a, a bigger venture capital firm to invest in it. And you know, this is somebody who invested in Zipcar early on, mm -hmm. uh, HubSpot, mm -hmm. a big marketing software company that's now public. So you have these individual investors, you have the bigger venture capital firms, uh, you have some philanthropically funded research. I mean, a lot of biotech companies that are looking at rare diseases, um, are funded by uh, groups like the Michael J. Fox Foundation, as an example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so so th I think you're right to highlight the fact that, you know, it's not just that, that diversity of funding um, helps give us a really wide aperture of like types of opportunities that we're gonna pursue, right? Mm -hmm. From let's address Parkinson's, uh, you know, let's address Parkinson's disease to robotic dogs. I'm not exactly sure what the robotic dogs are going to be used for yet, but maybe they'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, to Zipcar, uh, to, you know, we could list a whole bunch of other, to, you know, video game companies like Harmonix, which created uh, Rock Band and Dance Central and a whole bunch of fun music related games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's talk about the innovation trail because it sounds as though this project could only grow in future years from the, the uh, sites that have been identified so far. As you mentioned, um, a large number of, of organizations have signed on to assist with this effort. We had a terrific planning meeting uh, in Cambridge a couple of months ago where all the parties came together. There were some folks there on Zoom. Uh, but uh, talk a little bit about your aspirations for the project. Well, <laughs> what are my aspirations for the project? It's such a thoughtful question. I wish I had a thoughtful answer, but the aspirations, okay, so uh, coincidentally, I was talking, I was at an online event today talking to the CEO of TripAdvisor, the CEO and co-founder of TripAdvisor, which was founded above a pizza shop in, in Needham and is now the world's you know, most visited travel site. And if you go to TripAdvisor, the top two things that it recommends to do in Boston are visit Fenway Park, uh, which I think is built in 1912, 1914, I forget the specific date. We're in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And walk the Freedom Trail. Those are, yeah. those are one and two. And so my, my ultimate aspiration is can this group of people make the innovation trail at least number three of things to do yeah. when visiting Boston? Because there is so much cool stuff to mm -hmm. do and see. And you have uh, museums like the MIT Museum, Museum of mm -hmm. Science. Mm -hmm. MGH has a museum. The Broad Institute is, is opening a new museum this year. Um, so yeah, the aspiration is to be number three, but, but that's kind of a joke. The real aspiration is like, how do we tell the story in a way that inspires future generations of five-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 18-year-olds who are thinking about coming to Boston and go to college mm -hmm. to, to be the next generations of scientists and inventors and engineers and problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're so excited that the Innovation Trail has uh, the capacity to point people outside of the city as well. It's, it's, at its core, it's a walking trail that will have, uh, of, of, of Boston and Cambridge, that will have some um, side trips, if you will, or, or virtual trips to other sites that are not quite within walking distance within Boston, but like this place that we're at tonight. And then point people out yeah. here a little farther out of the city yeah. to Waltham as well. Um, the trail meshes so well with our educational mission. Um, you see behind you the, the belt and pulley system for driving this old machinery and, and uh, um, the, the mill on this site has um, utilized every innovation in power from water power to steam to steam generated electricity to being on the electrical grid. And uh, to have the chance to bring people out here and, uh, and, and foster a continuing sense and, and enthusiasm for innovation is so important to us. Yes, I second everything that you said. I feel like what's here is great. I feel like there are probably a lot of artifacts and places that we need to uh, discover and kind mm -hmm. of um, highlight with this innovation trail mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do, you know, you got me thinking about 
something else, which is, um, you know, uh, it's really just giving people something new to do mm -hmm. in this, you know, as we emerge from this pandemic, mm -hmm. right? Boston is a place where like, the known knowns have been so stable for such a long time, right? Like, oh, we have the great Museum of Fine Arts and you can go do a walking tour of Harvard, which has been there since 1636. Um, yeah. And you can do the Freedom Trail and there is, you know, old Ironsides, right? And so mm -hmm. I think the, myself and the group involved wants to create something new that makes people think about, you know, evaluate, think about place Boston in their brain in, in a different way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we're looking forward to reopening our galleries on April 1st as well and welcoming, welcoming the public back inside. Uh, I did mention that. Oh, and the other thing which I was going to say, which would fit if we could find this artifact, I think it would fit in this museum really nicely. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a last little tidbit that I wanted to, I wanted to mention. Um, Not a trolley car, I hope. Uh, it's a train car, so like probably bigger than a trolley car, but um, I think you could clear out the space for this. <laughs> Um, nobody knows what happened to this train car, but this is like, this is a classic, nobody in Boston knows this story, but we kind of want to make this part of the innovation trail. Uh -huh. uh, the company Technicolor uh, is called Technicolor because in the early 20th century, MIT was called the tech. And so two of the co-founders of Technicolor had graduated from MIT. The name Technicolor is an homage to MIT. Their first office is in this railroad car, which I've always thought that would be fun if we could somehow track down the original headquarters of Technicolor. Mm -hmm. They put it in a railroad car because it was not clear where movies were gonna be made in 1914, 1915. There was no Hollywood at that point. And so they could hitch their railroad car film lab to any train and send it anywhere in the country that you were making a movie. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the site, which I think is going to be part of the innovation trail, is this building Tremont Temple uh, right near Park Street in downtown Boston, uh -huh. kind of near the Omni Parker House. Mm -hmm. And it's the first place in 1917 that a Technicolor movie was ever shown. Um, the key year for Technicolor is, of course, 1939, when you have Wizard of Oz yeah. and Gone with the Wind yes. made, which yes. are kind of like the big breakthrough Technicolor movies. Yeah. But... Um, I just, I love the Technicolor story. I dream someday we're gonna find that railroad car and, uh -huh. okay, maybe not bring it here to the Charles River Museum, well, but bring it somewhere. Well, I was being a bit facetious. Somewhere. We may be able to squeeze it into this space. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be amazing. So if you're watching this YouTube stream tonight and you know where the Technicolor railroad car is, uh, please tweet me. So the, uh, the goal for launching the Innovation Trail with, with all of our colleagues working to develop content and develop a delivery system, um, hopefully in the spring? I think it's gonna happen in the spring of this year. And so uh, the, I think I put a slide up with the, with the Twitter. Um, yes. Or, uh, sorry, um, this is my Twitter handle, which you can follow, and I will definitely <laughs> share information about it. The bit.ly link that's on the screen is actually to a map of a lot of these sites that mm -hmm. we've been talking about mm -hmm. uh, tonight, but spring is the goal. Yeah. And one of our visitors, one of our viewers was wondering, uh, is, are the sites that you mentioned in Atlas Obscura? Oh, um, I haven't checked Atlas Obscura to see if all of them are. I think a few of them are. Mm -hmm. um, but Atlas Obscura is not 100% comprehensive. It's super interesting, but it's not 100% mm -hmm. comprehensive of every quirky, interesting, forgotten site. Uh-huh. And how do, you, how do you do your research? I annoy people with uh, <laughs> Twitter DMs, phone calls, LinkedIn messages, mm -hmm. text messages. I mean... I, I do think that the, the skills of being a reporter are slightly different from being a historian because I want to find the story in things as opposed to really doing the, uh, the deep dive on the history that's going to be footnoted and mm -hmm. properly sourced. But yeah, it's by annoying people until they talk to me. Well, I think um, uh, on that note, before we close, I did want to wish you luck in pursuing Ms. Hamilton. Oh, and yes. I was, the other thing is, like, yes, if Margaret Hamilton is watching the stream, um, you know, that is one of my goals to interview her and maybe get her to come to one of the Innovation Trail launch events this year, uh, mm -hmm. given that she does still live in Cambridge. Fun. Very fun. Well, we look forward to lots of people being there and, and celebrating this achievement.
Well, thanks to you and thanks to the whole crew and thanks to Bob for putting on this series. It's really been fun to be part of it. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And, and everyone at home, thank you very much for viewing this evening. We hope you've enjoyed the program.